All right, we live, and I cannot wait to introduce y'all listeners to today's guest. So on today's episode, I interview a self-described student of the psyche, myths, and dreams. A graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Cognitive Psychology, he uses cognitive, evolutionary, and Jungian psychology to help people discover, articulate, and change the stories that rule their lives. He is the host of the Myths That Make Us podcast. He's created a 30-day online journaling course called Making Your Myth, available at ericgodsey.com. And he is currently writing a book with his friend and New York Times bestselling author, Aubrey Marcus. Welcome to the Winner Circle, Eric Godsey. Thank you for having me, brother. It's, it's really cool to see how far you and I have both come since we first met each other, what, four years ago? For Go for yeah. your Yeah, four years ago now. Um, yeah, what a ride it's been. Both just went through spiritual college for the last four years and we're graduating. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What a beautiful life it is. Um, the first question, Eric, is a question you've helped me and many people discover on the path and I feel it's something we all ought to know and if you don't know it to the listeners there's no better time to start anything than right now uh, to begin that process so Eric Godsey what is your mission here in this reality plane my mission is to tell the story of Hermea and could you elaborate (laughs) yeah okay so Um, When I first started to try to articulate what my life mission was, it started as I want to create the most effective healing or the most effective psychological system for healing depression. And that eventually unfolded into, I want to tell the most adaptive human story. And now that has evolved into tell the story of Hermea. And essentially what Hermea is to me is... And it kind of takes a lot to even explain what this means. And this is why I'm going to write a book about it. But um, Carl Jung has this idea called ions. And ions are the gods of the time. And the gods of any specific time are the master stories that rule or possess the people in a specific culture about how to act. And so you can look at any culture and you can look at the deities that they worshiped. And the deities are actually anthropomorphizations of the stories that they believe about how to behave. One of the classic Greek stories is the story of Kronos, and he's the king titan before Zeus and any of his brothers and sisters are born. And Kronos um, got a prophecy from his mother that one of his children would overthrow him. And so Kronos, in fear of losing power, started to eat his children. And his wife eventually saw that this was happening and and, uh, replaced what was baby Zeus with a big rock that was shaped like a baby. Kronos ate the rock and she hid Zeus in a cave. And Zeus was raised by some wild mentors until he became a man. And he went and he killed Kronos and freed all of his brothers and sisters. I think Kronos is, I'm going to make the argument that he is the representation of our current healing story about what it means to be a human and what it means to heal a human. And if you look at our current culture, uh, people, more and more people every year are becoming sicker and sicker. And I'm going to tell the story that Kronos is the king of our healing story and he's eating us. And it's not on purpose, but he's, he's not helping, he's hurting. And instead of Zeus being the child that overthrows Kronos, I'm going to tell the story of Hermea. And I just, if I'm playing small, I would say I made up Hermea, but if I'm being honest, I feel like she's a story that's coming through me, through me witnessing my life and trying to understand it through Jungian lenses. And I see that the revolution in healing is going to be the rising of the archetypical feminine and that um, I'm going to do my best to tell her story and what it means. And that feels like the call of my life. Beautiful. Well, I can't wait to re- read that book. Um, when, do you, when do you plan on writing that book? So I'm in some way writing that book every day, but um, it will very likely be officially started on once I finish the book with Aubrey. And I'm not a co-author on that book. I'm, a, I'm the research writer for that book. And then once that book is done, I'm going to focus fully on writing this book. But so every article that I write on my podcast or on my website is feeding this thing 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So let's hear about, a bit about that book that you and Aubrey are putting together. Yeah, so uh, it's called Master Your Mind, Master Your Life. And it's the psychological companion book to his first book, which was Own the Day, Own Your Life, which is how to live the optimal day to really heal your body physically. And Master Your Mind, Master Your Life is going to use the rough structure of the hero's journey to take people through the 12 fundamental steps that the mind can get stuck at, that if you get stuck at, Uh, you get mastered by your mind. And we're going to teach how each of these steps can master you and then how you can master it and then give techniques for people to do to move through it. Mm -hmm. So you did a lot of research for this book, reading books (laughs) upon books upon books. So out of all these books that you read, what really excites you about what you're reading right now and what you uncovered in the the last few months? So the two major things that have come from this research has been uh, really learning the history of how pharmaceutical companies have engineered the current story of Kronos about and um, the corruption and the lack of efficacy and the lying and the damage that taking psychiatric drugs long-term tend to do. And So the book that most blew my mind for that was called uh, The Anatomy of an Epidemic by Something Whitaker. And then the next big thing is really learning what trauma is, how trauma affects the physical body, how trauma affects the emotional body, and how trauma affects the storytelling part of our mind, and then how to heal it. And what I'm finding is it seems to be that the root of most chronic physical illness and most mental illness is unresolved trauma and uh, what our current mental health and physical health treatment tries to do is it tries to minimize the signals from the body that it's been traumatized and at best it numbs and at worst it poisons people Mm -hmm. so how there is nuance there and you know it's going to take a whole book to explain the nuance but i want to make it clear psychiatric medication is not always bad and if used intelligently under the guidance of a skilled physician for a short period of time to help people pick up the practices that would allow their body to heal themselves it's very useful but It's something like 85% of psychiatric medication is prescribed by a general practitioner and not a psychiatrist. And most people who take it end up taking it far longer than it is safe to take. And then they end up taking other pills to manage the side effects of the primary pills. And the way it's currently used on average, it seems to be more destructive than healing. Mm -hmm. So how would you describe trauma? Okay, so what my research seems to show is that there are three types of trauma. Um, They're classic, what most people understand as trauma is PTSD, and that's technically called shock trauma. And that's where there's an acute situation that happens once that um, sends the physiological animal body into a fight, flight, or freeze response. And it's not full, it's not completed. And if the fight, flight, or freeze response is not completed, the animal body will continue to live as if it is in the presence of a life-threatening danger for weeks or months or years. And being in that hyper arousal state chronically for years or decades creates all sorts of symptoms that if you don't understand the biological effect of constantly being in a state of vigilance, They seem to not make sense. But once you understand how a chronic stress response inhibits sleep, which then inhibits your ability to repair your body, and that if you live in that way for weeks or months or years, all the ways that the body will try to signal to the mind that we are still in a state of fear um, become symptoms. And Peter Levine's work um, he's written a couple of books. He's kind of the top guy on, on healing what's called shock trauma. The other type of uh, less well-known but 
very clearly documented type of trauma is called developmental trauma. And developmental trauma tends to happen in young life when you're still a child and the trauma is happens repeatedly and it comes from a primary caretaker. And as a child, you are wired to seek security and safety from your primary caretakers. And so if they're also the ones who are inflicting trauma, it creates, it distorts what's called your attachment style. And this leads to all sorts of um, difficulties later in life. And the thing about developmental trauma is that we all have it, but most people only think it's the worst case, which would be like drastic physical or sexual abuse. But if you're a child and you start crying or laughing or playing, and your parent constantly gives you the signal that you need to inhibit that natural expression, your body begins to learn that it's not safe to express some instinct and that starts to get trapped in the body. And where it's most obvious in our culture is men are afraid to express their emotions. And so that gets bottled up and women are afraid to express their assertiveness or aggression. And what um, people who are experts at dealing with trauma find is that most men can't cry, quote unquote, and most women tend to have issues with their throat where they can't articulate or express anger. And that is a uniquely American version of developmental PTSD. Um, and that's kind of the light version. The heavy version is if you're repeatedly physically or sexually abused by a primary caretaker and that mixes shock trauma with developmental trauma and it makes it very hard to treat but if you know what it is and you understand the symptoms you can find specialists that know how to work with this and it is healable it is curable and if addressed if you have a whole bunch of other symptoms going on like you have depression and you have chronic bowel like irritation and you have really heavy periods and it doesn't make sense that you have all these different symptoms. Um, if you address these core trauma wounds and you allow them to heal, uh, all those symptoms tend to go away for people. The third type of trauma that hasn't been articulated in any of the books that I've read, but I truly think is a type of trauma is what I call story trauma. And story trauma is when an event happens in your life that doesn't trigger the fight or flight or freeze response, <clears throat> but the event disrupts a critical mass of the story that you unconsciously or consciously tell yourself about who you are, that you don't know who you are anymore. And if you don't understand who you are in a story sense, you don't have meaning and life doesn't make sense. And I think that that's the core of most depression. And the thing about depression is that there's a lot of things that can cause it. And it's one of the way depression is one of the symptoms of the body to the mind that something is off. It's not always story trauma. It can be completely biological, but when Pete, like, for example, you know, if you're with, if, if you're married and you're with someone for 10 years and you come home one day and you find that they've left and they left a note saying that they've been having an affair for five years and they're leaving you to marry this other person, you don't have classic PTSD. Your body is not in, it's not, it's not likely to go into a state of shock that you don't work through. But your conception of your entire past for the last 10 years, your conception of who you are now, and your conception of where you're going have all died. And our stories are a part of our emotional body. They help regulate our physiology. And if your story completely cracks you, I believe you've entered a state of trauma. And the way that that is healed is um, at least one way is through what's called expressive writing. And this has been documented by a researcher named James Pennebaker. And so those are the three types of trauma that I currently see. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about trauma and its effect on the body. Um, can right. you speak about that? Yeah, so... <clears throat> Um, we are animals first, 
we are storytellers second. If you look at our evolutionary history, we were able to adapt to the environment as animals for hundreds of thousands of years before we developed the capability to speak. The main thing that guides our behaviors, our primary guide in the world is through instincts. And when we enter into an environment where there is what is perceived as a threat, our instincts will assess instantly, do we need to run? Do we need to fight? And if we don't feel like we can do either of those, um, our last ditch effort is what's called the freeze response. And if you try to fight or you try to run and you're physically or psychologically inhibited, so an example of this would be like, and you know, this, I would like to offer trigger warning, you know, that this is intense stuff, but if you were raped and you were held down, you tried to run, but you were physically restrained and the body, our instincts are programmed that the body knows that it can rest again when it completes whatever the instinctual action was that came through the body to avoid the situation. So if you're held down or if you're drugged, and you're raped, your animal body wasn't able to complete the instinct response to get out of that situation. Um, and I can get into how this can be healed, but once, if this is ever addressed and you're allowed to process that experience, you will very likely begin to seizure in a way where your arms are pushing outward and maybe even your legs are kicking outward and you might start screaming no or stop because that was the instinctual response that would have played out in that moment if you weren't inhibited. Um, another example would be like, if you got into a car accident and you were smashed into the right side of the car and your body braced really tightly and before you were able to shake it out, you were strapped down into a gurney and you were taken to a hospital and they gave you drugs to put you out. They, the doctors believe that they're helping you but if you didn't tremble and shake and work out that energy, it's trapped. And you very likely will walk around with like chronic neck pain for a long time and not understand why you have the chronic neck pain. Um, the other one is the freeze response. So prey animals have learned that if they get captured, you know, so if a gazelle gets captured by a lion and it knows it can't run and it can't fight, <clears throat> its last ditch effort is what's called the freeze response. And the freeze response makes you completely rigid. You as an animal appear to other animals as if you are dead. You cannot move, but you are still alive and your heart is still beating very fast. One of the evolutionary advantages to freezing is that you disassociate from your body. So you're less likely to experience pain. Animals that go through the freeze response, they, instinctual, they instinctively know that if they somehow escape, they will have to violently shake out the super strong energy that constricted their body into rigor mortis. And once they shake it out, they go back to normal. Humans, because we have a mind and we, and we can tell stories about shame or guilt or fear, we can chronically inhibit that discharging of energy. And so our animal body continues to feel like it is in the presence of the life-threatening danger. If you're constantly in the, if you constantly feel like you're in the presence of danger, your sleep is going to be destroyed. If your sleep is chronically destroyed, your ability to repair your body psychologically and physiologically is impaired. And so then what, however your body uniquely would break down first, those would be the symptoms that you would begin to have first. And the symptom list is super long. I could pull it up on my computer, but um, the longer you stay in that state of hyper arousal, the more complex and wide varied your symptoms will become. And in our current mental health model, if the person seeing you doesn't understand trauma and the symptoms that trauma produces, they might give you eight different drugs to inhibit the eight different symptoms, but none of them will heal the core, which is that you're still in a state of chronic arousal. Mm -hmm. So when we bring awareness to the various traumas that we have, um, how do we wield choice to create change and heal those traumas? Right. So um, <clears throat> for shock trauma, 
um, Peter Levine's work and the type of therapy he created called somatic experiencing. The whole thing is about cultivating awareness <clears throat> on what he calls the felt sense. So if you ask most people what they're feeling, what they will tell you is a judgment, not an actual description of a physical sensation. So if you ask someone, how are you, you feeling? They might say scared or sad or afraid or good or bad. All of those are judgments. Like we are so disconnected from our bodies that most people don't even know how to articulate what it is that they are actually feeling. So what you are actually feeling is a tightening in your stomach that you don't want to feel and you label that fear. What he teaches is how to learn, how to simply feel, to sense what is happening in the body and then not to resist it. And if you keep the spotlight of your awareness on the sensation, it always transforms. And so what this would look like is let's say that you're a survivor of rape and you have like chronic constriction in your abdomen whenever you get still and you're not doing something. Um, he would teach how to slowly and gently sense into that feeling and then feel it be, and then ask you questions about like, what's it doing now? And he would watch your body and he would feel your body. And if he, if, if he felt it would help for you to move your left knee up and down six inches off the floor to like bring more energy to that part of the body, he would ask you to do it. And there's videos of Peter Levine doing this online with people. And it's, it looks like magic if you don't understand what's happening. Once he starts to get you to do small movements as you pay attention to the felt sense, always, people start shaking. They start tremoring. They might start crying. They might start screaming. And he slowly does what's called pendulation, which is if the felt sense of what we're feeling into starts to get too overwhelming, he'll bring you back to some memory or some feeling that gives you a sense of power or peace. And then once you feel calm again, he'll move you back into that part of the body. And what happens is what heals this and the mind or the psyche will do this intuitively if you give it the container to explore it is that you will either physically or through an inner vision reclaimed your power <clears throat> through completing the action that needed to be made. So it perfectly fits into your structure of its awareness. And then once you cultivate the awareness, it gives you a new choice. And the choice can be made now, either symbolically in a vision or physically through actions you make in the body that will actually change the way the past experience is remembered and you can release and process the trauma. Mm -hmm. So I've heard you talk a lot about trauma and its relation to depression and anxiety, um, but I'd love to touch on another subject that I don't hear you talk about as much, and that's trauma and its interrelatedness with addiction. Yes, 100%. Gabor Mate, who is one of the leading experts on addiction, is very clear, and he says that the root of all addiction is undealt trauma is undealt with trauma. And <clears throat> one of the studies that makes this the most clear is uh, when our soldiers went over to Vietnam for the war, a huge percentage of them, I don't know off the top of my head, but way over 50% of them did opium there. Once they came home, something like in the single digits, the people who came home stayed addicted to opium. And he says that that's evidence of opium is not addictive. Opium is a drug that if you have a certain biology and a certain psychology, it becomes an addiction. And that addiction is fundamentally seeking behaviors or substances that allow you not to feel whatever it is that you're feeling when you're sober. And that the core of trauma is addiction. And that um, we have a system where we punish traumatized people who are seeking to self-regulate their trauma through addiction. 
and we re-traumatize them through the system and the laws that we have by putting them in jail, making their record such that it's almost impossible for them to get a job when they get out, and adding a stigma and a story that people who are addicts are just weak-willed. And he's like, this is not the way. And one of the examples that he gives is, I forget what country it is, but some country legalized all drugs and they put up clinics where you could go to the clinic to do heroin. And it was a safe space and I believe it was free, but the one stipulation is you had to do the heroin at the clinic. And because it was safe, over the next four or five years, the amount of people addicted to heroin in that area where the clinic was went down each year. And what he explains is that people don't want to be addicted. And once they're able to get into the addiction in a way that doesn't re-traumatize them from that place of safety, they slowly intuitively through the healing intelligence in their body, slowly start to make decisions in their life that make their life better where they don't have to seek the addiction. And so he makes the argument that that's an example of how we could begin to treat addiction in a way that would actually solve the problem as opposed to continuing to herd traumatized cows into the meat packing markets of prisons. Mm -hmm. So we got on a little tan uh, off, off on trauma and that was great. And I wanna bring us back to something we have in common and that is go for your win. That's how we first met. And yeah. um, that is the course you took over and, and that inspired this podcast. So what does going for your win mean to you today, Eric? And what does that look like in your life? Yeah, so the idea of going for your win has evolved a lot for me for the last couple of years. And what going for my win looks like now is to live as much as my life in my dharma as I can. And the way that I conceptualize my dharma is to be a rainmaker. And there's an old myth or an old story that Carl Jung used to tell at most of his lectures the last couple of years of his life. Do you want me to tell the story or just... Or just no, I love, the, I love the rainmaker story. So <laughs> cool. yeah, go okay. for it. So the rainmaker story is... Carl Jung had a friend who was a Western anthropologist who was, you know, classically trained in the Western mind. And he went to China and he came upon this village that was going through a drought. And he goes up to the elders of the village and he asks them, you know, technical Western minded questions like, are you going to dig a well? Are you going to somehow bring in other water to deal with the drought? And the elders said, uh, no, we sent someone to bring the rainmaker and he'll be here in a couple of days. And the Westerner was confused, like, what does that even mean? And so he waits around and eventually this old man comes into the village and the elders come up to meet him and there's this big commotion and the elders bring this old man to a hut at the edge of the village and the old man goes into the hut. And for three days, the, the old man doesn't come out of the hut and no one goes into the hut. And at the end of the third day, it begins to rain and it rains all night and in the morning, um, the Westerner is the first person at that hut waiting for this old man to come out. And the old man eventually comes out and the Westerner asks him, how did you do that? How did you make it rain? And the old man said, I came from a land that was in order. And because the land was in order, the land does what it needs to do when it needs to do, when it needs to do it. So it rains when it needs to rain. When I came here, the land was out of order and it infected me. So I had to bring myself into order into order. And once I brought myself into order, it brought the land into order. And once the land was in order, it did what it needed to do and it rained. And that's the story of the rainmaker. And the idea there is the most effective way to improve the world is to bring yourself in order, which fundamentally means to heal and to understand yourself. And once you can connect to yourself in any situation that you are in, you will be able to intuitively feel what it is calling from you about how to be that would bring the most healing to that environment. And that is what it means to me to go for my win. Mm -hmm. And what elements of yourself currently are you in the process of bringing into order? Great question. Um, a big thing for me is to occupy my body more. Um, growing up, 
uh, I had shame around my body for being a man because the, I grew up with all women and my mom's relationship to my dad wasn't great. And whenever I expressed like aggression or power, um, it was not received well in my environment. And I escaped up into my head and I became very intellectual. And it's because I feared my body. And one of the big calls of my life the last couple of years has been to drop down from my head into my heart and to really like be in my body more. And I can feel that like my mind is honed um, and what I can do to bring more healing energy into my environment is to be more in my body. So what that means is yoga, jujitsu, working out, uh, ice baths, uh, um, sweat lodges, uh, things like that. And then mm -hmm. the other big part for me right now is to learn how to love people that I am in love with who don't form into the behaviors that I would want them to be in to feel safe. Like um, I'm currently in a relationship where the person has her own traumas, where she's not able to act in a way that would make my inner boy feel safe. And a big part of the call is what do I need to do, to do to bring safety and security to my inner child and not depend on a woman to do that for me? So those are the two big things for me right now about bringing order. And then a technical piece is I'm really being called to grow my business and to use it as a container to put my medicine out into the world more effectively. And so that, you know, all the technical things about like the finances and the emails and all that shit. Uh, but those are the three main things for me right now. Mm -hmm. And as you bring those three elements into order, you are bound to encounter what we all encounter on our path. And that's resistance, which Stephen Pressfield calls the negative force that keeps us from fulfilling our dreams. What, what does resistance look like to you right now? And how do you overcome that on a daily basis? Yeah. So um, resistance for me when it comes to my body is I tend to hold, I have some type of unconscious holding pattern in my right hip that um, when I'm not doing the things to take care of my body, that's the part of my body that most quickly will be like, hey, bitch, you're not doing what you know you should be doing. And so resistance to me is actually a call about where to put my attention. Um, in this relationship, the resistance came from trying to force this woman's behaviors to fit into the archetypical spot in my mind of partner as opposed to this is just someone that I love. And it was like, it's, it's been a hard 10 months of trying to f learn, like, how can I be in love with someone who doesn't fit into my category of partner? And the resistance was trying to force someone into that category. And so it was a call to adventure to me about what are my implicit expectations of how a person ought to behave to be my partner and then to truly see what are her behaviors and to feel into my body. And it's easier said than done, but to feel she doesn't match. And so I have to create boundaries to um, protect my heart. Uh, and then when it comes to the business, resistance is just simply not looking at my emails or not looking at my bank statements. And again, my relationship to resistance is that it is actually my ally and it is showing me where I'm not looking, where I'm not paying attention. And so then the invitation is, what am I feeling? What are the stories I'm telling? And what is the next right action that I can take in this direction? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about um, your relationship. You've been in a relationship for the last 10 months and there's been a lot of learnings in that path. Um, what are some learnings that you'd love to share with the listener um, that really helped you um, keep keep that relationship growing strong yeah so <clears throat> one of the most interesting things that i've learned about relationships the last 10 months came from reading a book called we by robert johnson and the core idea is that most of us 
So every, all of us have the religious function in our psyche. And it doesn't matter if you believe in any religion or not. There is a part of your psyche that wants to be connected to the divine. And because most religious containers have been destroyed because of rationality and the scientific method, um, we no longer have containers to hold that projection of the psyche. So what most Western people have done if, is they've deified romantic love. And most people will unconsciously project their idea of God and what the relationship to God feels like <clears throat> onto their partner. And they will worship their partner. And there's this idea in Jungian psychology of the anima or animus projection. And what that means is <clears throat> it's a technical fact that when you meet somebody, you have no idea who they are. And in order for you to even interact with them, you have to project a hypothesis about who they might be based off of people that you've known in the past. And then you slowly will learn who they actually are by their behaviors. This projection is most intense and most distracting from the truth when we fall in love. When, when you quote unquote fall in love with someone, you barely know who they are. So the fact that you can feel that you are in love with them is because they fit the projection of your inner ideal other that was molded by your parent of the opposite gender in most situations. And so we project our soul onto this other person. <clears throat> and this is called the limerence phase. And it can last up to about 18 months where <clears throat> you just want to be in their presence all of the time. You feel like they give your life meaning and that they are perfect and impeccable and you can't believe how lucky you are. And then what happens after about a year and a half is that projection starts to fade and you begin to learn enough about them to see who they actually are. And most people will interpret that feeling of, oh, I fell out of love. And so then they will go seek a new person to project their fantasy onto. And most people will just go from person to person to person to person, continuously projecting this ideal other. What we teach is, is the ending of that projection is actually the beginning of the opportunity to actually love another person. And that's been a big part of my dance with my partner is learning uh, that she's actually not my partner, you know, that I can love her and that she's not my partner because she, my projection and who she actually was were so far from each other that it caused a lot of turmoil for almost a year. And now I'm starting to see clearly she is not my partner. She is someone that I love and now that I see that clearly, there's so much less um, frustration and anger. Um, and so that's, that's been one of the most important things. The other big important thing is, <clears throat> for me personally, I learned as a child that it's not, it's not safe to express my anger towards the feminine. Um, and so I realized a couple of months ago that I never once... I've never once in my life expressed anger towards my mom or towards any romantic partner that I'd had. And this current partner did things that made me so angry, but that I felt so safe to express myself with her that for the first time in my life, I actually expressed anger towards a woman that I was in a relationship with. And I did, um, I did an LSD experience where I was really feeling this experience of like how angry I was and what to do with it. And I had this huge breakthrough where I realized like I kind of went back to being a four-year-old and I allowed myself to be angry at my mom for some actions that she did. And then I had this cascading vision of each major relationship I'd ever been in when I was actually mad, where it was okay to be mad and in that visionary space, I expressed the anger that I should have expressed back then to each of these partners. And it, it just, it unlocked a thing in me. And then I was able to actively express anger towards my current part, partner in a clear way where I wasn't blaming her for anything, but I was articulating what I was seeing that I did not like. And I expressed that I was angry. And for men, who have a hard time expressing their anger towards women, 
that if you can consciously do it, it's what allows you to create clean boundaries. It is, it is conscious aggression that allows you to hold strong, clean, clear boundaries. And that's been a huge part of um, why I've been able to consciously decouple from this woman is because I'm now able to articulate clear boundaries. Mm -hmm. So let's rewind 10 months and let's discuss on how to attract um, a healthy partner and how do you, um, how do you create those foundations at the beginning from day yeah. one? Okay. So um, <clears throat> there's an amazing book called way of the superior man that I've read a couple of times. And the core idea from that book that I've integrated is that for the masculine and both either a man or a woman can be. So the idea is that all of us have a masculine and feminine aspect to our psyche. And most men are more than 50% masculine and most women are more than 50% feminine. And that's the energetic pull that they hold most of the time. For people that hold the masculine pull, that they're more masculine than feminine, what will give your life the deepest meaning is to serve your mission in the world, your dharma in the world. And that if you seek relationships as a higher priority than how you serve the world, you will never be in a stable relationship because you are not a stable being. The idea is that people who hold a feminine polarity, their highest thing is relationship, is to be in relationship. And that they need some, someone who's able to hold a stable masculine pole for them to circulate around. And that as someone holding the masculine charge, in order to be stable in relationship with someone who holds the feminine, your highest calling, your highest principle has to be your purpose, how you serve the world. And so one of the examples that he gives in the book is your woman will unconsciously test you by saying, don't go to work today, stay home with me and let's cuddle and watch movies. She might unconsciously feel that that's what she wants or he, you know, whoever has the feminine pole, but that if you acquiesce to that, she will actually unconsciously trust you less. And that one of the calls is you have to orient your being to your mission and then as a secondary function, relate to other people. And there's a fine line there between being, you know, like a workaholic. And that's definitely not what this book is advocating. But for me, what I have found is that my relationships are best when I have a core four hours in the morning every day that no matter what, I show up to my desk and I serve my Dharma. And then after that, I relate to people with full presence. Um, the two times my relationships have gotten very unstable have both been when I sought more to be who I thought she would be most attracted to than just being me and serving my Dharma first thing every day. And both of those times when I became unstable, the relationship became very unfulfilling and it didn't rectify itself until I reoriented myself to my Dharma. Mm -hmm. You mentioned boundaries and I feel the most important boundaries are the ones you set with yourself um, right. so that you could then set them on to others, whether that be um, an intimate relationship, friends, employers. So let's talk about boundaries, setting it for yourself, setting it for others. Yeah. So my top boundary is do not lie and do not do anything from a place of hate or fear. Um, I don't always, I'm not always successful with the don't do something from a place of fear, but I'm, I am very consistent at telling the truth always and doing it in a loving way. And that's my top rule for my life is to speak and act my truth in love. And, um, I, I can always hone how well I articulate my truth and how much love I articulate it in. But I, I, I don't flat out lie. You know, 
the the most I'll do is I'll joke, you know, and like a joke on some level is like a small lie. But um, the other thing is, and I don't always do this, but when I do, my life is always better, is I will not sacrifice my dharma to please you or to please other people. Like I will not put you before my dharma. And um, the other one is I take responsibility for parenting my inner <clears throat> my inner child uh, and I will not put that on you and again I don't always succeed at, at that as well but <clears throat> those are my three major big ones mm -hmm. so you mentioned fear where is fear coming up in your life right now and how are you overcoming it um I think fear for me right now is <clears throat> if I was acting in fear, I would not, I would cut my ex-partner um, out of my life completely because it would be easier. Um, I'm not doing that. I wanted to do that. And I sat with that for a couple of weeks and I realized that it was an act of fear. And <clears throat> for me, one of my biggest course correctors is to pay attention to my dreams. And I had a really clear message in one of my dreams about a week ago that um, cutting her out completely was the equivalent of me saying no to a final test <clears throat> and choosing to eat ice cream with my hand instead of doing the hard thing. And so that was a really clear message of like, I was avoiding the hard thing and doing something that was empty to avoid the test. Um, my other fear I think would be, um, I'm doing ayahuasca again in January and there's some fear there, but I, I recognize again that like resistance, fear is a compass and it's actually pointing you towards what to do. And so the fear of my ayahuasca experience is going to actually bring me to meditate and to journal and to do the dieta properly and to get off social media a month before and just have the complete clear space to go into this fully. And like resistance, if you learn that both fear and resistance are actually compasses pointing you where to go as opposed to things to avoid, it transforms how to live life. Mm -hmm. So you talking about social media and I know you like social media. I read a post where it's like the first thing you check in the morning, you allow yourself to check um, I just recently watched um, the documentary, The Social Dilemma. I actually watched it a couple of times. And it talks about how social media really programs the way we view reality. Um, so how do you stay aware of that yeah. um, with your social media consumption and use? Yeah, so this is a great topic that I'm becoming more and more interested in. I had this talk with someone that I really respect a couple of days ago. And um, he articulated that social media is the new fire. And if you take a moment to feel into one of the most revolutionary inventions in our evolutionary history was when we learned how to use fire. And the thing about fire is that if you don't contain it properly, it can destroy everything. Social media is a revolution in our history and it's brand new in evolutionary time. It's been around for one second. And I think it's the new fire. Like I just got back from a fit for service mastermind event <clears throat> where everyone involved went through massive healing. That thing was only able to be created because of social media. Social media put out the signal to people all over the world that it allowed us to meet in person. So social media is not all bad. And also feel into the insidious story to believe social media has the ability to program you without your consent. What I think is going on <clears throat> is that we've given fire to children instead of creating initiation rituals to teach people how to dance with fire. And so what that would look like is I think people need to understand that a cell phone is one of the most powerful, it's one of the most powerful archetypical powers that's ever been created. And that you should go through an initiation ritual to even be able to wield it. And so that comes down to parents, like parents 
are responsible for learning how powerful of a device this is and learning how to interact with it in a way that brings healing into the world and then to teach their children through some type of initiation ritual about how to use this. And because this is so new, we have no elders yet who have learned how to create initiation rituals to help people dance with this fire. It is not all bad. It is fire. And if you don't know how to use it, it can fucking burn you. But if you know how to use it, it can be one of the most powerful healing devices in the known world. Mm -hmm. And I agree. Um, I think it's even more powerful than fire. And we still have only our primate brains versus millions of AI brains against us. So those rituals to help prepare us to use social media wisely, I think is important. What would be the first step in that you advise parents and young people and really anyone today um, to be, bring awareness to? Yeah, so a really beautiful thing is you can go to your discovery page on Instagram <clears throat> and you can choose to approach it like you're a researcher. Look at what's populated. That device is telling you what your current unconscious drives are. And so something that I do is when I see that there's too many clips of games of basketball or stupid ass memes or delicious fake asses on there, I will go out of my way to go through the discover page and find inspiring quotes or beautiful art. I will like it and save it because I understand that the algorithm will favor the things that I save. And now when I go on my Instagram and I go on the discovery page, it's beautiful. It's fucking <clears throat> inspiring philosophical quotes, amazing art that inspires me. And because Instagram knows that I'm a man and I'm 29, it will still populate asses, even though I never click on them. Not never, but almost never. <laughs> and that like, I have used the programs to give me what I want to see. And um, you know, one of the things is you, you can use it as a meditation and you can go on there and you can slowly slowly with awareness go through what am i clicking on what am i interacting with and then another powerful thing is when i'm really on top of my game i'll set a timer for an hour i have one hour each day where i will use social media and then after that i fucking don't use it and one of the things that i do is i'll move the icon of the social media app to a new place on my phone so the muscle memory isn't there and the thing is, is the moment I start to click on it again, I instantly remember where it's at. And so I'll move it for the following day. And then every once in a while, I'll just do a complete fast, you know, where I won't, where I will delete all of the apps for like five to six days. Like when I am going to do ayahuasca, I'll probably get off of it for like a month. Mm -hmm. I, I did that last year. And mm -hmm. I only got back on once to share an article or to, to write a post that I was really inspired about. And then I got back off. Mm -hmm. So when we first met, Eric, you have not yet explored plant medicine. And today you have experienced many. Could you have gotten to where you are today without the use of the plant medicines? So I hadn't done ceremonial plant medicine before we met. But before we met, I had done mushrooms probably 20 or 30 times. Um, I would not be who I am without those. And uh, to claim otherwise, I think would be a lie. Um, <clears throat> there is, there are realms of experience that I do not believe are attainable unless you do plant medicines. You don't need to, but because I am, <clears throat> because my highest obsession is to understand the human psyche, it would be irresponsible for me to not explore different realms of consciousness. It's a part of my calling. And um, it doesn't need to be done, but I truly believe that if done with a ceremonial container and with intent, guided by people who truly understand how to hold that space and guide that space, it is one of the most healing things that we can possibly do. And that, like, for example, the Joe Rogan podcast that came out recently with the author who wrote the book, The Immortality Key. These medicines, these plants have been a part of every culture in their healing tradition that we have record of. And we are finding more and more records of all the major 
cultures having some type of initiation ritual that involved <clears throat> plant medicines. And <clears throat> if you look at our culture as a anthropologist now, we are the sickest culture that has probably ever existed on this planet. And a huge part of it is because we are so disconnected from nature. We are disconnected from our nature in our body. And I believe that the ceremonial use of plant medicines can help us connect back to nature itself and to the nature within us. And that I think it's one of the most powerful ways that we can bring healing into the world. Mm -hmm. And I agree. Um, but I see often a lot of people don't treat it as sacred as it truly is. And this is something I talked about with Jason Havey, um, CEO of On It, about on his episode is seeing people going back to ceremony month after month after month after month. And they're almost doing it for the sense of community and, not, and looking for answers other elsewhere than the self rather than taking that message that they've learned and putting it to practice putting into action, putting into their being. Um, so I think that's just a caution. Um, 100%. <clears throat> and I think that if you're doing it with true elders that understand it, they will guide you away mm -hmm. when you keep coming back. But also there is something unique about plant medicines that it self-regulates. And so if you treat it without intention, it will likely burn you. And if you do it too much, like I know people who other people would say they do it too much, and then they get clear messages from the medicine, stop, do not come back until you do X. And then if they come back and they haven't done X, they will likely have a very hard trip. And one of the things that I wanna articulate is what happens in that space with those medicines, it's not something outside of you. It is something within you, but it's outside of your ego. Mm -hmm. And most people I know who do it ceremoniously <clears throat> don't do it too much. The people who quote unquote do it too much tend to do it outside of ceremony. Like I just had someone share a story with me in the sauna the other day that his friend will pull over in traffic and hit a DMT pen and wait for traffic to end and then drive again. That's not the way, brother. That's mm -hmm. not the way. I agree. So um, along our journey, we encounter many challenges and obstacles. Um, what has been your biggest challenge on your path thus far and how did you overcome that? Hmm. Probably my biggest challenge on my path so far has been uh, before I became aware of it, <clears throat> I would use the power of my mind to justify not doing the thing that I was afraid to do in a way where I thought I was being like smart or clever. And <clears throat> it was accidentally eating 180 milligrams of THC two years ago that put me through the hardest experience of my life. That was the most terrifying experience of my life that taught me that I could hold my shit together in a terror that would never exist in my waking life, that then gave me the self-belief that I could begin to do scary things. And literally four days after that, I applied to on it and got the job. So powerful. But before that, for years, I would use my mind to justify not doing things that I was afraid to do. And I was basically lying to myself. Mm -hmm. So that was your greatest challenge that you overcame. Let's now talk about your greatest life lessons learned on the path. What has that been? Man, I think the biggest life lesson came from my last night of ayahuasca, um, where the core message was, you have to Mufasa your Simba. And what that means to me is I am responsible for being the father to my inner child that I never got. And that it's not my dad's responsibility. It's not my mom's responsibility. It's not my boss's responsibility. It's not culture's responsibility. And it's not my lover's responsibility. It is my responsibility. Also, I think the biggest, one of the biggest lessons that I learned is <clears throat> the ego is not the master and should not be the master. 
the master of my psyche is my soul and to learn how to use my ego to serve my soul and that what my psyche is, my conscious mind is 1%. 99% of my psyche is the unconscious mind. And the way that the unconscious mind speaks to the conscious mind is through things like dreams and synchronicities and visions and learning how to listen to my unconscious and to bow my ego to it um, has been massive. And then the last thing, and I think that this comes down to how the ego can serve the soul is it is a spiritual commitment for me to speak and act my truth in love. And that whatever happens as a, as a result of that is the best possible thing that can happen. Mm -hmm. How would you define truth and how would you define love? That's a great question. So it's not objective truth because I don't believe humans have access to objective truth. It is, what is the truth of my experience now? And can I articulate that as honestly as it arises in me? And then in love comes down to, can I do it in a way where I am not blaming or hating or fearing the other person that I'm explaining this to? Am I, am, am I sharing my truth in such a way where I'm taking complete ownership? I'm not projecting, I'm not blaming, I'm not criticizing, I'm not attacking. I'm simply just opening my motherfucking heart up. And then whatever happens as a result of that is the best possible thing that can happen. Beautiful, thank you for that. So as we move towards the end, um, I have a final two questions that I ask all guests, but there's something uh, we didn't get to that I, I feel is really important to touch upon. And that's um, a part that so many heroes get stuck on their hero's journey. And that's crossing the threshold. Um, listening to that call to adventure rather than staying put um, because of fear or because they are in a comfort zone and they're afraid to go beyond. So can you talk to us about the last threshold that you crossed and how you overcame that? Um. Yeah, so <clears throat> I did 5-MeO DMT a couple of days ago, and it is the most potent psychedelic on the planet. And literally, there's a threshold that the ego has to walk through in that experience where the ego dies. Um, so one thing that plant medicines can teach you, but other things can teach you is that there is something behind your ego that witnesses the ego. And the thing that witnesses the ego has never been afraid. It's never been hurt. It's not ever been sad or betrayed or abandoned. It is the thing that witnesses your experience always. And most people don't even understand that that thing is there. And so they hyper identify with their ego and they're very attached to whatever arises in the ego. <clears throat> the scariest threshold for me has been when I do a powerful psychedelic and I can feel that I'm entering. And again, this is beyond language, but the best that I can articulate it is like I'm stepping into eternity or the void. And when the consciousness goes there, the ego can't go there. The ego falls apart. And um, if you resist it, if you resist the falling apart, you are going to suffer. And so uh, for me, in those moments, I just repeat to myself over and over and over unconsciously, love, love, love. And then the ego fucking melts away. And then it's just pure awareness. And <clears throat> So that might be ab ab abstracted people. I think a more concrete one would be um, choosing to still love my ex quote unquote partner, despite the fact that I wish that she would be different so that she could be my partner, but she's not. And mm -hmm. that for me has probably been the most recent threshold. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. So your words of wisdom for that hero at the cliff hesitant to jump what would you whisper in his ear try faith 
for one week. Try the faith experiment that if you do the thing that you are afraid to do, no matter what the result is, you will, you will feel more heroic <clears throat> having done it. And your life will probably be better. Just run that experiment for one week. Mm -hmm. All right. So the final <laughs> questions that we ask every guest, the first one, in three words or less, or three words in a phrase, how will you describe the experience you are having on this earth? A beautiful remembering. A beautiful remembering. Excellent. And now I know um, you believe in magic. And I believe in magic as well. And I'm going to use some of my magic and I'm going to transport us both into the future. I'm going to transport us to the 85-year-old Eric Godsey, the same, the same age as your mentor, Carl Jung, passed away. So Eric Godsey at 85, what does your life look like in that year? And what is the legacy that you've left behind? Mm. I am with my wife. I am a grandfather. I am in a beautiful home in the woods on the edge of a lake. Um, I can feel into the fact that I have given my gifts as fully to the world as I have possibly been able to give them. I've cultivated a sacred relationship with my wife that has transcended language and age and sex and um, our souls are one soul and two bodies that I can look my children in the eye and see that they know that I chose to be their father before um, being a CEO or being a philosopher or a psychologist. Um, I have left a cathedral somewhere on the planet that people go to, to, to connect to themselves. Um, and that there is a community of hundreds of people that I have shared intimate initiatory experiences with who through knowing me have learned how to connect to the God inside of them that guides them to their Dharma and that I've left a story for Western culture that is moving it more towards healing and further away from destroying the planet. Beautiful. And I want you to keep that picture of that 85 year old self, Eric Godsey in your head and in your heart. And I'm going to use my magic one last time on this call. And I'm going to bring us back to right here, right now, 2020. What message does that 85 year old Eric Godsey send to you? You're doing it. <laughs> Beautiful. And that is a wrap on this conversation. I'm so appreciative that you took time out of your busy schedule. I know you're still writing that book um, and it's going to be coming out soon. When's the dead? When's it coming out? What's the update on the release of that? Uh, Aubrey pushed it back a year. So it's going to come out uh, 20, May, I think 2021. Um, I think it's coming out 2022, actually, uh, in March. Okay. So, so it's going to be another year and some months before it gets to the public, but it's going to be good. Well, yeah. And in the meantime, we can check out your blog on ericgodsey.com. I just saw on your social media that you wrote your longest post of all time. It's um, not so done yet. It's almost done. What's that about? Trauma. Okay. So keep your eye posted on that. Um, I highly recommend people also check out your website for your making your myth 2.0 course, which I did a uh, 30 day journaling course that I couldn't rec recommend enough. Um, you're a huge um, advocate of journaling. And when you do that course, you'll see why they can find you on Eric Godsey on Instagram. Where else can they send the, can they be sent? And uh, the, the myths that make us podcast. And then that about covers it. Yeah, that's right. All right, so to close every episode, we raise our fist and we bring it in for our digital fist bump. Boom. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Namaste. Love you, Love Namaste. you brother.